Good afternoon. For my first piece, I will present an extract from Eight by Ella Hickson. I play Andre, a young homosexual man who runs an art gallery with his boyfriend. In this scene, he arrives to work late to find his boyfriend hung from a scarf he bought him for his birthday. I have to say, this wasn't quite the ending I had in mind. Then again, I'm not sure what I did have in mind. Probably a whisper of happy ever after, you know, wearing matching cardies, sharing digestives. But I never thought I'd been stupid enough to pin anything on it actually happening. I think we can all agree that coming into work half an hour late on a Monday morning to find your boyfriend hanging from the rafters by an Hermes scarf. Well, it's not exactly happy ever after, is it? <laughs> He was never going to wear it. I don't know what I was playing at giving it to him. He wasn't the scarf type, never had been. I would spend my teenage years trying my very hardest to look like Cindy Lauper. <laughs> him? No. Going out with a butterfly over a zip was his idea of outrageous. the sodding ambulance. He can't just be up there like that. Well, I suppose the rush isn't on once they know resuscitation heroics are out. More or less a removal job now. Oh, his big purple head dribbling all over an M imprint. Why he chose the bloody stock room. It's not like he was being shy. I mean, tying an Hermes noose around your neck is uh, hardly the same as popping a few pills and drifting off, is it? May as well have done it in the f***ing window. Nice piece of performance art. No. He wanted to save this one just for me. One man show. They're bound to judge, aren't they? Snoopy little paramedics. Two queers, one art gallery, one corpse. It's not going to look good, is it? <laughs> they look for syringes and hamsters. And expect some paid by the hour 12 year old to pop out with a dummy in his gob. I wish we'd ever been that bloody exciting. The drama, the hype. He never used his gayness either. And gayness is pretty serious ammunition in the art world. But he just didn't have very much gay in him. What I mean is, he was the least gay guy I'd ever met. <laughs> he hated gyms, hated Stella. Never wore a pair of matching socks in his life. Practically heterosexual. It was his niche. Totally normal bloke that happens to like men. I, I could see it happening. I watched him quietly shatter beneath it all. Sat on that couch, eating himself into oblivion. There's more macaroni cheese in that corpse than I can bear to think about. <laughs> I, I tried to get him down. I did. I had him in my arms. I took his weight for a second, but he was too heavy. I had to let go. Let the airmails take the straight. I watched his big purple head loll forward. Was this his parting gift? I felt shocked for the first time in a decade. My second piece is an extract from Room to Let. I play Roger, a man whose mother died and whose father left him at a very young age. In this scene, he confronts his estranged father and tells him about the difficulties he faced growing up. You'll 
never be able to make up for what you've done. At school, the kids called me a bastard. I used to dread it. Walking through those big black metal gates in the morning where they'd all be waiting for me. The sky was a yellow and grey. And you wouldn't believe how low I was for a nine-year-old. They would tear my hood off my coat or hit me with their belts when the teacher wasn't there. Oh, they lie in my face and make me lie in dog sh If they didn't call me bastard, they called me fleabag or lurgy or leper. Mum couldn't afford new clothes, so I never told her about the rips in my trousers or in my coat. I would sit in my room and sew them up myself. Every day, I thought you might come back. I imagine you walk up that garden path and you'd look up and see me in the window. And as you'd come through that front door, things would be normal again. The sun would come back. Christmas would be a time to look forward to. And I'd never have to sit and hear Mum crying downstairs, listening to that same song every five minutes. Oh, but you never came back, did you? You never walked up that garden path, did you? You just walked right out of our lives! existed, as if we didn't either. I wanted to find you. I wanted to see what you had to say. It, it was heartbreaking to watch her die. It killed me, Eddie. It really killed me. And where were you? You weren't by her bedside. You weren't holding her hand. Tell her everything was going to be all right and that God will look after her. But the more hurt I felt then, the more I would make you pay. And now I don't have to cry anymore because it's your turn now, Eddie. It's your turn to do the crying. <laughs> 